Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Steve Swank. I'm a game designer at Flashbang Studios, and I'll be your moderator today for the panel on innovation in indie games. Um, I just wanted to very briefly speak about the impetus behind this panel. Uh, I think a lot of times innovation gets talked about, um, sort of bandied around, especially with respect to game design. And a lot of times people talk about it like it's this panacea for the game industry, like it's going to fix all the problems of the game industry and, you know, we wouldn't have endless sequels and we wouldn't be pinning ourselves into a corner design-wise with these genres and whatnot if we just had more innovation in game design and, you know, we wouldn't be heading towards the comics ghetto is the sort of common phrase that people use. Um, and I, I buy that. I think that's definitely true. And I, I think the fact that we're in this room with this many people right now speaks to the fact that a lot of people uh, agree that in terms of the why, definitely there are some problems that we need to address. And, you know, innovating is, is one of the sort of solutions there. Um, but one thing that kind of bothers me when people kind of whitewash innovation in that way is that nobody really speaks to the how. Nobody really talks about, you know, what are the practical methods and strategies that you use? Like when you sit down in front of your computer, you know, how do you innovate? So assuming that you think that, you know, we need more innovation in game design means we need more creativity applied to game design so that we can expand what we're actually creating in terms of interactivity and we can create these experiences that will have this great meaning for millions of people and will, you know, be impactful and change the course of popular culture and so on. Um, how do we do that? And so that's kind of what this panel today is all about. I think these four guys that I have here with me have made some really significant and pretty awesome strides in terms of answering that question, you know, how do we actually innovate? So anyway, the panel today is going to be run relatively informally. I also had some coffee, so I'm talking a little fast. Um, so uh, first we're just going to have everyone introduce themselves, and then I've actually asked each of the panelists to create a little thought blast, a mini rant, if you will, on the subject of innovation in indie games, and then we'll have some questions that um, I've prepared. And then we'll just take questions from the audience. All right. So without further ado, why don't we just start with uh, Genova and work our way down? Okay. Can you hear me? No. Hello. There we go. All right. Uh, I'm Genova Chen. Uh, I'm from Shanghai, China. Uh, I graduated from USC Interactive Media Program. Uh, I worked on more than 20 different student indie games and uh, commercial games. Stayed, worked for some big studio before, but uh, I managed to learn as the guy who made uh, Flow and Cloud. Um, that's pretty much me. Yeah. All right. Um, I'm John Mack. Uh, I've written a bunch of games that probably nobody's ever heard of, but you might have heard of this one game called Everyday Shooter. Um, and yeah, okay. Some fans. So uh, yeah, and if you haven't, you should go check it out on Wednesday. And I didn't get a perm. <laughs> Hello, my name is Kyle Gabler. Uh, I was one of the guys on the experimental gameplay project where we made a bunch of games in one semester. Um, then I worked at EA for a while and left, and then just recently started a new indie studio here in San Francisco. Hey, I'm Jonathan Blow. I've been an indie developer for about 11 years, uh, doing some mixture of you know product development and consulting that whole time. Um, I wrote the Game Developer Magazine technical column, The Inner Product, for a couple of years, and I started the Experimental Gameplay Workshop here at the GDC about six years ago, uh, where we look for and showcase uh, the newest and wackiest things that people have been doing uh, every year. Um, that's about it. Cool. So uh, I think Kyle wanted to go first. <laughs> Pardon our laptop swapping. Press the magic button. Is anything happening? <laughs> hey. But now I can't see it. Victory. <laughs> oh. 
Okay, good. Yes. Okay. This is what I'm talking about because I misunderstood the assignment. Um, <laughs> my name is Kyle Gabler, and I got hit by a car while riding my bike in San Francisco. So be careful out there, it's dangerous. Um, okay, so I wasn't really sure what I thought about innovation or you know, even if it was something worth pursuing or something that worked or that we really needed. Um, so to get an objective view, I decided um, well, let's just see what things might be like 30 years in the future and then judge from there. And it turns out that's pretty easy because there are these people called futurists who predict things in the future. And I think the only criteria to be a futurist is that you call yourself a futurist and make some predictions. So that's a warning about the possible quality of this information I'm giving you. Uh, so we did a bunch of stuff in the last 100 years and somehow we made it to the year 2007. And I'm going to kind of extrapolate what things might be like 30 years into the future. But first, two notable things happened in 2003. Um, I was in grad school and like the heads of two large studios both told me that don't make an indie studio, that time has passed, it's all about blockbusters and you'll never survive. And of course the statistic that, uh, you know, nine out of ten businesses are failures. Um, also, uh, there was a prediction that by the year 2007 we would have animated tattoos. <laughs> we have a few months left. Um, okay, so here we are, in, we're in 2007, and entertainment is, you know, it's pretty non-immersive. We just kind of like look at stuff on a screen and press buttons and crap. Um, but, and indies innovate because it's the easiest way to compete with the big studios because obviously we can't compete on volume and quantity of assets. Um, so we can have this novel factor and like it's our little gimmick. It's new, we've never seen it before and so you can buy my game because we're not competing with you. Um, anyway, 10 years into the future. By 2017, not much has changed. We have Terra PCs, uh, optical computing, uh, neural networks, um, entirely immersive tactile experience, uh, and image possibly projected directly onto the retina for, you know, super immersive experiences. But these are large and non-portable and probably uncomfortable. Um, okay, 10 more years. By 2027, uh, consumer computers will have surpassed the raw computing power of the human brain. And that metric is like in computations per second. So, I mean, I don't know how meaningful that is. Um, anyway, but an entire person's life, also by this time, will be able, everything you see in your entire life here, will be able to be recorded in uh, full high-res video and hi-fi sound, and it'll be stored in under a petabyte available for under $100. Um, and thought recognition becomes a viable uh, input device, and all senses will be triggered via direct neural stimulation. Um, ten more years. This is the magic one. Um, by this time we'll have knowledge chips where you can learn things, uh, kung fu. Um, <laughs> and at this time almost all time is spent in virtual spaces. Uh, so geographic proximity becomes uh, irrelevant uh, in terms of communication, meetings, and education. Uh, and commercially available computers by this time can do in 30 seconds what would take current computers one million years to do. But that was a prediction from 1997. So. Okay, so, but anyway, so by this time, just 30 years in the future, something amazing happens. Um, computing power exceeds our ability to use it, is the idea. So bandwidth, storage capacity, computing speed uh, will be seemingly infinite. Um, and of course, there's skeptics who say that it's entirely likely our ability to waste bandwidth, storage capacity, and computing speed uh, exceeds our ability to create them. Um, but Freeman Dyson, who's not exactly a futurist chump, he, like, he's a pretty legitimate guy, said this. Um, so, cost of tech, tech is going down, uh, processing power, uh, and, but our ability to use it isn't increasing at the same rate. So anyway, um, this is the big point. As technology becomes cheap and ubiquitous, uh, the only thing left with meaning is artistic expression. Uh, and so by this time, 2030-ish, uh, the information age will end and we enter a new period of art, music, entertainment, self-actualization. And this will be a new renaissance. Except more tech. <laughs> um, 
So another way of thinking about this is that all these like stupid technological things like graphics, technology, and simulations and like resource management, they're all just things which we use to support our grand idea of games we make. Um, so those things become irrelevant and the only thing of any value anymore is artistic expression. Um, and only those people who can innovate in artistic expression and gameplay uh, will be the ones who will be celebrated. Um, this is like a mini rant. I don't know, I can skip through this fast. So every time a new technology is introduced, we have these dumb metaphors like desktop. I guess that kind of makes sense with computers like so people can understand. It's like mass market crap. Uh, DVD player. So you actually have the little buttons that you would have on the hard to use player anyway. So why, finally we got away from that metaphor. Here's one that pisses me off. I make or write music. And why in the world? That's actually software. Why do we have to have a cooling fan graphic on software? And like... <laughs> It's, it's just, it comes with all the inconveniences of the metaphor you know, it's uh, mimicking. Um, and this is one we still have not escaped, but I do hope we will in the next several decades. This stupid human metaphor. Like in every game, like, okay, we're going to make a game. What's the guy going to do? What about a game without a guy? You know, uh, so you don't like run, jump, shoot. Um, so these things will go away and we'll be left with more useful, entertaining, meaningful abstractions. Uh, anyway, so that's done. Back in 2007. Um, so we're already seeing this trend happening at experimental gameplay. We run competitions, um, you know, like, hey, high schoolers and professional game guys, make a game in three weeks based on this theme. Um, we did a recent one where we did a theme, make a game with on dance pads, not a dance game or something. Um, so we got a bunch of entries, people from like professional game developers submitted stuff, uh, you know, just all kinds of people. The, there was one that really stood out. It was cohesive, the music, the visuals, everything. The gameplay just was, was this perfect ball, the solid thing, um, and just innovative. And so he won the grand prize, um, but he couldn't take it because it turns out he was 16 and had the ability to do this and blow everyone else. Uh, line rider, wave of, you know, this whole last year. Um, so I guess the point of all this is that, you know, uh, innovation in games is not dead. Uh, in fact, we're going to be seeing newer, cooler changes in the gaming paradigms and they'll be happening faster and faster. And we don't even have to do anything about it. Um, the bad news is that the cool stuff will likely be put together not by us or me, but by some kid with the pirated version of Photoshop and Visual Studio who doesn't even know he's innovating. And so that I have. All right, so uh, before I talk about it, I just want to comment on Kyle's version because uh, Steve told us that we only have four to six minutes to talk about our idea. <laughs> um, so I didn't really prepare anything but the four to six minutes, so I'm going to run through this really quick. Um, all right, um, hold on, let me redo re this. Okay, uh, my topic is design for entertainment. Uh, you probably don't know what I'm talking about right now, but I'm, I hope you can understand in the end. Uh, when people talk about innovation, um, you will think about something different or something that could uh, predict the future that will be the, the next big thing. Um, but instead of talking about the future, talking about a game I've made in the past, the difference about those games, I'm going to just, um, uh, instead of giving you a directions for the future, I think that as indie game makers, the, the fact that you are here is that you already know what you want to do. I mean, I'm not here to tell you what you're supposed to do next. As an indie game maker, you probably have something that you really want to make in your desire. Anyway. Um, so I'm just going to share you some thoughts I have learned recently. Um, something very fundamental, uh, something like a root of video games, films, music, literature, everything that you can consider as entertainment. Um, I'm kind of questioning myself, what exactly is entertainment? Um, I think that just like human will be starving when they, you know, they will want to have food, and when you are thirsty, you will have drinks, right? Entertainment is something, just another, 
you know, another type of food that to fulfill your feelings. Um, so feeling has all kinds of feelings. So I'm, I'm talking about entertainment being the food for all of them. Uh, it's kind of like a vitamin. You know, you, as a human being, you will be sad, you will be happy, you will be, you know, angry. Sometimes, you know, you need all of them. You know, a human being cannot always be cheerful. He will have time that he feels very sad. Um, so today, um, the society is really competitive. I feel like, um, as even as a game maker myself. Having accomplishment, you know, have a feeling of you accomplished, involve, uh, you improve yourself is really hard. Um, when you come back from home after whole days of work and you get nothing done, you pretty much feel like this. Um, <laughs> but we are really, really lucky because, um, you know, we have all kinds of food to satisfy the need of your feelings. So. You know, if you feel you accomplished nothing once you're home, what will you do? Uh, there's this one on uh, television that uh, keeps you, you know, engaged with the, the main character and the story. So every day you watch the TV, you feel, oh, you know, I feel like, you know, things, you know, become better. You know, the mystery has been solved every day. So you kind of have a sense that you're improving over with the story. And of course, it works for books. And uh, recently, a lot of people enjoy playing this, uh, and which is essentially making you feel you're improving, you're gaining something every day. Um, so even though your work didn't get something done, but as long as you see something growing up, you will be happy. Um, that's exactly what entertainment is. It's, it's satisfy your needs for certain emotion without embarrass yourself you know, under the rules and the constraints of, of our society. Uh, I believe you enjoy that moment. Um, but now I want to talk about something that is more mainstream. Um, in movies, people care a, a lot about the feeling. Um, movie is, in fact, one of the most effective food for feeling. Um, in fact, if you look at the genres that movie has, uh, they are all divided based on the feeling, you know, from the positive, feelings to the negative feelings or the cold feelings, um, but the entire media, the entertainment is divided by feeling. Um, but if you look at video games, video games didn't start immediately to become an entertainment form. It is more like a niche software market, uh, you know, software product when it first came out. Um, but now everybody say, oh, video game is one of the new mainstream entertainment. Um, but if you look at the video game genres, you know, very few actually talks about a feeling, and most of them talks about technology, you know, features. Um, when you look at review and the critics, you know, when people think this, inter this form is an entertainment, they will talk about it, they will use the words to describe the feeling of this experience. When people treat this thing as a product, uh, they will use the words to describe the features of the games. I mean, that's my impression of what a video game review is. Um, so my point is just, as an entertainment form, video game itself needs more feeling, okay? Uh, not only how it's reviewed, um, which I think very, it's very important, but also how you design video game. Uh, if you design a video game, you know, instead of designing a product, uh, it should be designed based on the feeling. Um, so, you know, design games as if it's really an entertainment. And, and how, right? How do you design game as entertainment? I think this is what uh, this panel is going to talk about. And uh, um, thank you very much. All right, so I noticed that uh, all the other panelists have PowerPoint presentations, and I thought I'd innovate a little and <laughs> not have a PowerPoint presentation. So this panel is called Innovation in Indie Games, and um, what I'm specifically going to, uh, going to address is, is innovation 
you know, really what we, what we want. And lately I've been thinking that, you know, I don't think innovation really is that important. And I started thinking this when I kept reading about different games that were deemed artistic, and they always had this word next to it called innovative, that this game was innovative and artistic. And I keep thinking that as a game's medium, you know, it seems that artistic, to be artistic means that you need to be innovative. And I just think that's, I just think that's bullshit because, you know, what if I were a singer-songwriter, then suddenly is my inner expression invalidated just because I'm using my vocals and a, a guitar, a formula that's been done time and time again? So I think what really makes a form of expression interesting, unique, and artistic is that it's an individual's expression. It's not that, you know, it uses a fancy physics engine, and similarly, it's not that it innovates. So when you start comparing a game's worth based on whether it innovates or not, then you're starting to use an objective scale to measure it because you're ranking these games based on innovation. So in that sense, saying a game sucks because it doesn't innovate is kind of like saying, you know, a game sucks because it's not 3D, because it doesn't have this feature. Worse yet, if you buy into this need that you need to innovate, then, you know, you're sort of, you're, you're letting all these external factors leak into your decisions that are creating this game. That game won't be about you anymore. So it's kind of like how mainstream makers, like, I think mainstream game makers have that same problem too, except that, you know, instead of trying to be different from everyone else, they're trying to be the same as everyone else. An indie game, game maker will try to be different from everyone else, but that's still based on what everyone else is thinking, and not based on what you're thinking. So, but I think that, you know, ultimately what matters is that you create something that is what you want and what you feel is good, even if others think it's crap, even if it's run-of-the-mill or it's deemed to be clony by others. After all, you know, the piece is about your heart and not the heart of a thousand others. Um, I guess one caveat of this thinking is that, you know, if we didn't innovate, wouldn't we just all make the same damn game? But I don't think that that would be the case because, you know, simply because as individuals we're unique beings. And so as long as you embrace your individuality and embody it in your work, then your work will also include that uniqueness. In other words, follow your own inspirations and never compromise, even if you think it's crap or mundane, and your work will automatically have that personality. And as an example of that type of thinking, let me just say that I never made Everyday Shooter to be an innovative thing. I created an album of games because I liked how music albums were a collection of short songs. I use vector graphics because I love vector graphics. And I have guitars as the music and the sound effects because I love the sound of overlap guitars. It wasn't because I wanted to be innovative. You know, it wasn't because I wanted to be different. That was just what inspired me. So, you know, I mean, when you boil it down, like, everyday shooter is just a shoot 'em up. It's, fuck, it's like, it's, it's something that's been done time and time again. But I think that's sort of akin to the singer-songwriter example in that just because I use the same formula doesn't mean that that's an invalid form of expression. That being said, I think innovation is great, but in a more academic sense, in that, yeah, okay, it does give us, you know, new ways to think about the medium and new ways to utilize the medium, but so does a new physics engine. So, in other words, you know, what it comes down to is that the medium, as a method of personal expression and innovation, becomes a non-factor. Um, and making the game is not about furthering, or making the game as a form of personal expression is not about furthering the medium, but it's about using the medium in whatever form you know, it is now. So to answer the original question, is innovation really what we want for personal expression and art? I don't think so. Okay, so 
the danger of going last is that you may have a substantial amount of overlap with previous speakers, uh, and I do, but I'll try to give that to you from a fresh perspective that might, uh, you know, give you a little bit of a different opinion on things. Um, you know, in doing the experimental gameplay kind of work that I've been doing for a long time, um, I've really come to care about games as art, but I've also thought a lot about what is innovation? You know, what does it mean? What is it for? Right? And here's sort of two things, two quotes that sort of characterize to me what the indie attitude toward innovation is. One is that lack of innovation is an industry-wide problem, and we're here to fix that by doing new stuff. And the second is, games that don't innovate suck. And I believe the first quote, and I don't believe the second quote, but I think these are conflated in a lot of people's minds and in their viewpoint. And I want to explain why it's actually not true and why innovation isn't necessarily important in the way that people think it is, even though it is important. Um, so we have a lot of uh, other media that have been explored thoroughly in history, uh, like books and films and songs, and there are works in each of those media that we consider great that really impact people's lives. Um, and innovation in these media is often celebrated. Like I saw Children of Men last month and they had some really tricky cinematography in that movie that helped them get some really long shots. Like that was really great. But that's not really what made Children of Men great. Um, and uh, in general, you wouldn't say that a great work is great because of its innovation. Like in rare cases you would say that. But really, the thing that makes, you know, one of Shakespeare's plays great or, you know, pick anything, um, is something deep inside the work, some expression that comes out and reaches you. Um, so the question is, uh, innovation is, if innovation is not necessary for that greatness, what is it? It's kind of orthogonal to the greatness. And if it's not connected, if you're doing innovation for innovation's sake, which is kind of what I feel like indies are clamoring for, uh, well, we kind of have a lot of example of innovation for innovation's sake in these other media. Uh, it's the kind of innovation that doesn't reach very deep and that's really actually often more about distracting the audience into giving you money, right? And that's what we call a gimmick and we have plenty of examples of that in movies, right? Um, and whereas, you know, gimmicks can be kind of entertaining and give people something kind of flashy that they'll talk about for a little bit, they don't exactly produce greatness. They don't produce deep feelings and, and good art, I don't think. Um, so, so it seems to me that as the indie games industry, when we say, oh, all games should innovate and games that don't innovate are terrible, we're kind of aspiring to gimmicks a lot of the time because we're not, we're not classifying what that innovation should be, what its role should be, like where, what, it, we're just saying like any kind of innovation and that's, I think that's not good. It, it leans us in the wrong direction toward gimmicks and that's kind of sad. Um, but then again, you know, the mainstream game industry can't even do gimmicks, right? They're so uh, innovation averse. So, so isn't that more sad? Maybe so. Um, there's a lot of sadness to go around for everybody, I think. Um, so, so innovation for innovation's sake, I don't think that's really what we want, right? Um, but we feel we need it, right? Because games that don't innovate are not satisfying, at least for the people in this room and, you know, for a lot of players too. Um, and, and my, my personal opinion about that is that games as an artistic medium are not yet deep enough to hold our interest, right? We get bored of the old games because they didn't reach deep into us and like grab hold of something the way a good novel or a good film can do. Um, and that's a problem. That's a problem for us and we have to confront that if we're ever going to make games that are like relevant to humanity. You know, how many games would you say like this is relevant to humanity alongside, you know, the Sistine Chapel? painting or whatever. Does anyone know how to make windows not do this? This is, ah, uh, okay. Um, but, so that's a problem, uh, but that's actually where innovation helps us, right? So this is my awesome graphics that I did during lunch. Um, this, this big blue thing over here, this is the space of all possible games that we could ever come up with. Um, it's actually this wacky multi-dimensional space kind of thing, but this is a 2D production, projection of it, right? And the green space there is the games that we know how to make, right? Um, and what innovation does for us, right, is it gives us each of those little new green dots as a new game that was innovative and it's a little outpost out there. Like I cast my fishing line into the unknown and like I caught something and that kind of worked and that uh, helps future game developers see what's out there and then we can expand that green territory, right? So that's all great. But those little green points are not, those aren't like deep, valuable art. Those are just like examples of innovation, right? 
the actual value, <laughs> the deep like art of games actually comes from farming this green territory that we've already discovered, right? Expressing things through that, right? So we want to expand that territory. That's what innovation does for us. But the innovation doesn't give you the meat. It doesn't give you the reason why we did all this work exploring all these games, right? Only doing kind of what Jonathan was saying and what Genova was saying, just expressing something gives you that. And you don't need innovation to do that expression, right? So um, kind of what I'm saying is uh, there's no sin in just staying within that green area and not innovating and just farming it and doing the best thing that you can. And in fact, I say that we need to do that because we need to provide examples um, to society at large and, you know, the audience of game players to show them the potential of games, you know, that they're not just cool graphics or this wacky new gun that shoots through walls or, you know, whatever innovation you might think of, um, but that they can actually say things that are deep and important to them, right? Um, and it, if we don't do that, you know, maybe, maybe we're going to start going down the comic book path, well, continue down the comic book path, right? So uh, that's all. So do you think that the area that we're in right now, the green area, so your smaller green area, is that too small a space to encompass true artistic expression that will speak to humanity in that way? No, it's not. Um, but it is, uh, like, like you can always find a very niche audience that will appreciate a certain thing. But if you want to be relevant to humanity as a whole, we need to expand it by a lot, right? Um, you know, there are niche films that only appeal to a small audience, but films as a medium can appeal to everybody, right? We're not that way yet. So how do we get there? I mean, this is, you know, anybody a, a, can... A lot of hard work. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And a lot of... So, so the other thing that, that wasn't part of this rant because it's too short is that most innovation is, ends in failure, right? Like you try something wacky and it ends up kind of sucking. And we just have to do that over and over until we find the things that work. And that's hard, you know? Okay. Yeah. Anybody else want to sort of speak to that at all? I mean, do you think that that's the reality of the situation we find ourselves in? Well, I think that instead of just uh, randomly shooting out and uh, trying to reach, uh, that's, I mean, a lot of people fail in that way. I think that before you throw out your fishing pool, you should know which direction are you aiming towards. I mean, I, I talk about, uh, you know, treating game as, a, you know, based on the feeling is one of the direction which I believe has, you know, a lot of fish there. So I, I shoot out pools towards that direction. And luckily, I, I you know, I have two, two fish already, but... Uh, um, I think that before you do that, you should think which direction you want to go. And you have to believe it and work really hard in order to get something back. So what direction should we go? Well, I, like I said, I think that different people have different opinions. Um, and uh, I'm not trying to tell anyone, you, this is the direction you're supposed to go. I just say, this is the direction I'm supposed to go. OK. Hello? <laughs> I want to disagree and say you don't have to have a direction and instead you like you model the space of games as like an, a swarm of breeding organisms you splatter them in every direction some will die off the ones which like catch on will continue to breed and make new innovation They'll, it'll just happen automatically you don't have to apply any effort um. that's a great right. that's a great metaphor by the way I'm kind of with Kyle in that I don't think he needs directions either. I think that I think that if you if you just look at each other, you know, you see each other as humans, but that's not which that's not what makes you you. What makes you you is how you utilize all the things that make you human. How you talk, what you talk about, what you wear, um, and when you start, how do you say it? When you start trying to have this direction, it's sort of like when you're at a party with an ulterior, ulterior motive. Instead of being at a party, to be yourself, to have fun. Instead, you'll become this sort of, you know, if you go to a party just to like, oh, I'm going to see people there, I'm going to network, instead of having fun, you're sort of not being yourself anymore. And, you know, and, and that will show through your work. It, your work will become a purpose thing, something that's engineered to do something instead of being who you are. You should be able to look at your work and say, yeah, 
That's me. If I were a video game and not a human, that's what I would look like. That's what I would sound like. And when you would talk to me, you know, that's how I would respond to you. So, yeah, I think sort of, that's sort of, I was going to ask John, what, what, what is, how do you farm? You know, like, how do you farm that area? Yes. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if farm is the, right, is the right word exactly in this context, because, <laughs> like, farming sounds like a deliberate artificial thing, and I don't think that's true, but... Um, the way, you know, the way like everyday shooter is very obviously influenced by a wide array of games, right? And it was, you know, you played those games at some time in your life and they resonated with you in some way and they came back out as this expression of this game that you made, right? And um, I think that you can sort of think of what I said as farming as being something like that if you're going to do it in, in the sort of natural way that you're talking about where the larger that pool of influences and the more diverse, you know, perhaps the more powerful of a thing that can come out. Certainly the more diverse of a thing and hopefully more powerful. So I think it's, it's, it's more like not... It's more like not, um, not having it in your consciousness, I guess, right? It's not a conscious... Making art isn't a conscious thing. Making science or make, building a bridge is a very conscious thing. Yeah, I mean, for me it's not, but I, I think that's an individual thing, right? Some people are very analytical and some people are impulsive. Yeah, well, I will comment. Okay, I will comment on the, the art and the innovation. I, I think that innovation is not necessarily art. I mean, art, I very agree with what Jonathan said. In, in fact, I've seen an interview of Bruce Lee, and he's talking about he being so unique and you know, and different is because he stayed true to himself. And I think that, that is, you know, a true artist that express himself. Um, but I don't think innovation in games has to be art. Um, you know, art is, is a very vague word that uh, could cover a lot of things that I feel that innovation is something that you feel um, that not a lot of people is doing it. And this thing that you feel that has to be done, um, then you should do it. Either this thing is truly what yourself is, or what you think other people need, that could be different. I mean, I consider myself making games for a large public. I, I want to make games for many, many people, and I wish them to enjoy it. Well, I mean, if I'm, I'm an artist, I would say I would just make a game that I like it. That, that's a very different purpose. And because I want to make game for a large audience, that I wish that audience can can play it, so I will tune the game so that you know a large amount of people will play. That's very, very different from an art. Well, I just want to make something that I like. That's that's a different purpose, and I think both have the potential to be innovative. But just I mean, being an artist is not the only way to be innovative. Is there a correlation like, okay. between? Sorry. Is there a correlation between how much? you love something you're making and how much other people like it? No. Because I, I felt like <laughs> we were saying that if I make something I love, then other people won't like it. I'm... I don't know, maybe I misunderstood. Like but like, in, in making like games and music, like little stupid movies, the things that I've made that I've loved and didn't care if anyone else loved them are the ones that people end up liking. And well, I think whether people like it or not is a non-factor. I mean, I think... I think that one thing that is obvious but people forget is that art is subjective, you know? You will make, people will make art that they love, but it's a piece of shit to everybody else, you know? Like, I remember when I was a kid, this movie called Titanic came out, and you know, I asked one friend, and he's like, dude, man, don't go watch, you know, after the movie's over, I want to get a refund. You know what? I asked my other friend, and he was like, that was the most enlightening experience of my life. Like, it exists simultaneously as a pile of garbage and as a mountain of gold. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's a subjective thing. Well, I have a, so recently I'm also looking at art. I feel like um, I'm just looking at all the traditional art and artists. I just feel that some of the artists, they create great um, artistic piece, but the, the, the people at the time didn't understand him. He might be too early. Um, so the mass didn't enjoy it. Uh, we can even consider like uh, the first the first MMO game like Ultima Online as an art because it's so ahead of its time. Only a very small group, the the you know the the cult people will actually enjoy it. But today, if you look at World of Warcraft, 
it's very much just like the old art, but it's, it's in its prime time where the majority of people can enjoy it. I think that you know, there are, there are art, art that you make as the pioneer, and there's also art you make for the public, for a large group of people to enjoy. Um, I think as an artist, while you stay true to yourself, you express what you like and you, you love the most. If you happen to be living in this society, you are also representing, a, you know, you're breathing and you're eating, you're you know, accepting the same environment as, as the, the public too. So if you have certain desire and it's very likely that your desire is shared by a large audience and then when you create that art that will be enjoyed by a huge uh, community because you're speaking for the public too. Um, but well, sure, there are artists who only speak for themselves, which I, which I also know a lot of them. Um, but I, I just feel like, um, I think the, 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 most well, um, the most welcomed artists are the ones who have the same desire as a large group of people. Okay. Can, can I come? Okay. So about <laughs> your, the, okay, I just want to talk about what he was talking about, about the pioneering. And I think that a lot of people forget, I, we were sort of talking about this uh, yesterday, I guess you weren't there, but. <laughs> I, we were talking about it, um, about the fact that when you, you, you can't be afraid to piss people off. You have, to, you have to piss someone off or else your work sort of becomes, I think Steve put it well, it sort of becomes this thing that people aren't interested in and, and then you know you've completely failed. But like, I mean, even if you look at like flow, it's, you know, Genova is saying, yeah, okay, I want to reach out to all these people. But even flow, there's people, you just go on the internet and look on the forums, people will be like, this is fucking garbage. But like, you know, it's pissing people off, but it, it's, it's great work. It makes you think about games in a different way, and that's why it's pissing people off. So, you know, I think you shouldn't be afraid of that. Like, the, the opposite of greatness is indifference, not pissing people off. Yeah. Well, I would say there's a fine line between, uh, you know, just making something that, well, I mean, you can make something that's purely based on your, on your own um, like tastes. You can make, if I would have been making Flow just purely for myself, it would be the hardest game ever that nobody can even enjoy it. But the reason I made it easier is not because I like it, because I want the people, the other people be able to pick it up. I mean, we all talk about games need to be easy to pick up and hard to master, which it's not necessarily true, but I think that a lot of people do that because they want more people to be able to enjoy it. And the, the only reason I tune it is because I want more people to enjoy it. It's not because I like it. I mean, I have a specific um, level of difficulty that I would like for, to play Flow, but I mean, I wouldn't consider my design for Flow being truly just for myself. I, I really think that's a purpose for, for, for other people, to consider other ones who might haven't played that much game I wish they can enjoy it too. That's, um, I mean, I think that's different. All right, so let's shift gears here a little bit. We're getting a little heady, I think. Um, is rapid production, rapid prototyping necessary for innovation or you know, true creative thought for farming or whatever metaphor we decided we wanted to use? I mean, is it necessary to, to do rapid production? How are those two sort of linked? Because they seem to be fairly linked at this point, at least from what I've been seeing. You want to start with that one, Kyle? Yeah, I mean, you can have a good idea and make that, and it'll be innovative. Um, I mean, but prototyping is just a tool. You know, try hundreds of ideas because I don't have this idea that all ideas, like everyone has the same great ideas, which actually suck, and then, but then just some people have more ideas than others, and those bubble up to the top and become the ones that are released and become innovative. So, I mean, it's a tool. I mean, what's great about having a rapid prototyping tool is that you won't be afraid to throw out the garbage. Like a lot of times I found back when I was a kid, I would, you know, I'd bust my balls implementing this feature and then it would suck. But I would be like, no, the game has to have this feature because, you know, I, I can't have kids anymore making this feature. So like, <laughs> so like rapid development gives you a good way to throw out the garbage, I guess. Speed dating is another rapid prototyping. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think rapid prototype uh, is, is just, I think, you know, everybody likes it. And uh, I think the, the best way 
I mean, the, the best thing about it is that you can use it to communicate. I mean, either communicate saying this design sucks or saying this design is good. But no, no, usually when you just say that, nobody will believe you. But if you put a prototype into someone's hands and let it play it, in, in the end, game is a visual audio and an interactive you know, art form. So I think prototype is the best way to try to communicate. I mean, talk is audio. I mean, showing a concept art is just visual. A visual, but uh, prototypes, it's integrated together. It's the closest you can get before, before you actually truly make it. So I really think that's the, the most important tool, especially for indie game makers or student game designers. That's how you communicate with others. So we're kind of running out of time here. I want to move on to audience questions. But could you guys just give me like a little 30 second, you know, what would be your ultimate takeaway for people who've come here who want to create games that push the frontiers of game or innovate or, you know, to make art or, you know, whatever you think the best possible goal is in terms of pushing the medium? You know, what would be your sort of brief takeaway? Like what, what should they do? Let's start with John and go down. That's a hard one. Um, yeah, actually my, my talk tomorrow is going to be a lot about this, but um, you really have to th throw away the ideas that are only really good, and you need to find the one that like you have to make, and that if, if you don't make it, you know, or, or that if you do make it, like you can't imagine another game being that good ever. Like until, you, until you've focused on that idea, you don't have the right one yet, because it takes a long time and a lot of effort to go into these things, and you can easily spend all that time building something mediocre. Okay, to make an innovative game takeaway in a sentence. Make as many games as you can and don't fall in love. Um, I mean, the saddest thing in the world is someone who has the best game idea and they spend like their whole life making it. It really is just mediocre. So just, you know, be a slut. Hundreds of games. <laughs> okay. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Don't innovate. Go home. Play a lot of games, figure out which ones you like, and then make a game based on that. Uh, I would say that um, before you start innovating, think about what you can do, you know, being the most effective and being the most useful thing to games as a whole. I mean, I'm not talking about just making game but about you know, the, the whole industry. Maybe you are someone who is good at writing reviews. You are maybe someone good at writing critics. Just figure out the best way you can contribute to this field. Then think about whether you are the you know, right person to, to innovate in game design. Or maybe you, know, you can do something more useful. I think that you know, I just feel that innovation is not like the, the last, uh, you know, the first choice to improve this industry as a whole. If you love games, you figure out the best way you can, you can contribute to it. All right, we're going to open up to questions from the audience now. Anybody have any questions? Yes. Um, you seem to have touched on a topic that I feel is exceptionally taboo to talk about, that games as art. Why do you feel I mean, I don't know if you realize this or not, but whenever it comes up in a lot of discussions, many people dismiss games as a form of art, even though we have such prominent things. Why do you feel that possibly art is such a taboo word with inside the realm of games? Um, well, the ones that we've made so far are usually really crappy art. Like, <laughs> it, you have to have really played a lot of games and really had a good connection with a few of them before you really understand the potential. And I think most people in the world don't see that potential right now, right? Because we haven't shown it to them, because we're just not doing things that are very good. But also, I think also that... Just because it isn't art, just because it was engineered to be fun, I mean, I don't think that's bad either. I mean, I play a lot of games that were just engineered to be fun, and, you know, they're fun. What's wrong with that? But engineering's not art. It's not. I'm saying it's not bad to be not artistic. Sure. I'm saying no, no, that's there's, there's a that's place fine. to be artistic and there's a place not to be artistic. So if the goal of art is to like, have uh, end emotion, one of the first games I played was Roger Wilco Space Quest IV. And, <laughs> and like, when I walked into the space mall, when the girls took me to go shopping, uh, 
I was just overwhelmed with wonderment. Oh my God, I can talk to anyone. I can lick the ground. And like, there's a response for everything. And like, that feeling of wonderment is just something which I cannot find you know, frequently in games. But it's something that I try to put in mind. And gosh, that's art for me. Yeah, and I mean, art here is, is really a complicated word. I mean, there's so many different definitions. I mean, I believe my understanding of art is totally different from your understanding of art. Um, but I think that a lot of people here talk about art is referring to that experience which totally overwhelmed you, that moved you, that you feel that, uh, you know, you're touched by it. And, and I would think that is the art, what, what we are talking about, um, instead of, of just being an artist and being different, being, you know, hippie. Let's take one from that mic and then... Uh, it sounds like you're not the f kind of folks who would fall into this trap, but uh, how do you uh, recognize, what are the danger signs when you're going too far in uh, serving innovation instead of your, uh, your grand concept, and how do you pull back from the edge? Well, that's a good question. Well, first of all, you have to have a grand concept, right? Without a grand concept, what can you do? You poke around, you try. That's what innovation is. I, I'm trying to come up with a brief answer to this one. I mean, this is something that I actually see often. Like for the experimental gameplay workshop, like people submit stuff to us every year. And sometimes we get stuff that's like, obviously they were just trying really hard to do something different, but didn't have a good grounding in reality about like what makes this a game that's playable. And um, you know, I don't know that I have a magic pill for that. Like either you're, either you have a perspective or you don't. And um, you know, I actually, again, in my talk tomorrow, I'm going to approach this from a different direction. Um, what time is that is, talk? Uh, I don't know. At 10 o'clock? <laughs> ten, 10 to 11 uh, in this room, I think. And, uh, but, but so my, my approach on it now, so, so the problem is that uh, I think as Genova was saying or someone was saying, it's really easy to convince yourself that your crappy game is actually good. No, Jonathan was saying this. Because you put all this work into it and you, you're really like married to it now, right? And um, that's like human nature, and how do you get around that? And so the upshot uh, for me is that you know you're doing something right when you end up discarding the idea that you started with and doing something different that you got to by following that idea. Because that sort of proves that you're not married to it um, and proves that you, you started somewhere and then got somewhere better, you know? But, yeah. Get a question from Keith there. Hey, thanks. Um, my question has to do with how innovation in probably a, a larger scale uh, project um, affects, uh, excuse me, how innovation affects, how innovation, in, how innovation in one part of a larger scale project affects the rest of the project. Um, this is something I've discovered um, building adventure games um, where I had a concept that I thought was really innovative, but it was also part of a larger piece, which I ended up using making, more, quote, more mainstream for the rest of it, but it ended up, in, it ended up affecting the rest of it to a degree that it was really hard to say how it was actually going to turn out because it was such a big fundamental piece of the rest of the pie. I was curious how you would go about um, if there's any generals or ideas you have about that subject. Well, I just feel like, okay, so while I was working at EA, we also say our game is innovative internally. Uh, I mean, from external perspective, it, um, a lot of game doesn't look like innovative because the innovation happens on the components, like bits and pieces. There's innovation here and there, but overall, the, the, the whole feeling, the whole experience feels like mm, just like another game. There's some, some new things happening here and there. And I think that um, when you work on a huge project, if the, if the core direction, like the overall goal is different, um, that will chain re they'll create a chain reaction that every aspect of the game has to do some changes in order to, to you know, coordinate with this direction. And then your entire game will feel quite different and innovative. Um, I think that the innovation in a higher level, in a direction, is, is more important than the pieces and you know, bits and pieces, basically. I have something to add. Uh, there's sort of a pick your battles aspect to that, where you can have a game and you can innovate part of it, and then you have to worry about how that flows with the rest of the game, like you were saying. And you can do that, and you can eventually make that work. But maybe it's better to just not make that game and look over here and make this other game where the innovation is like the core, and it, it like everything springs from that. 
and you can build a whole unified thing and, and get something stronger. I'm so about, I am talking about that latter thing you mentioned, where the innovation is really the core of a, of a, a big driving piece of the rest of it. But because it's, it requires the rest of it to be a whole part, it, ha it does affect it, them strongly. So. Um, yeah, and, and, and it's, that's it's been a very difficult problem to deal with. I also just have to spend extra time working on the project to to resolve those issues because they're just you know explored ter they're the territory that's exp being explored that's new. Even though there's a lot that you know, what you know in the past is slightly changed by it, and you can't just follow the same rules. You have to keep applying innovation to make it all fit together. Yeah, it's hard. You know, you can't yeah. have a schedule for something that's new. That's and so, in a parlor. You can't sit down with a design document either. You can't just say, ah, I've got, the, I've got this innovative idea. We'll create the design document. No, you actually have to start playing with it and playing with it. No, it, it's, it's a hard path to walk, and that's just yeah. like how it is. You know? And you. with that, we are out of time, I'm told. Derek, if you want to ask your question, you can come up. Sorry, dude. <laughs> Wait, all what? Right. Oh, two, oh, OK. I'm no, sorry. Sorry. I all had right. a good one, though. Thanks very much, everybody. Can we get a round of applause for our panelists? <laughs>